This is a continuation of the points that I raised yesterday. And essentially what I did in the first lecture was show how similar, or I attempted to show how similar the sacrifices of the Old Testament are to the Lord's Supper and how similar they have to be in their meaning. The sacrifices of the Old Testament couldn't take away sin. All they possibly could do is remind God to act. God had promised that someday he would take away sin, and the sacrifices as memorials, as things that ascended up into God's presence and came near to him, as Peter said last night, they are all korban, they come near. As things that come near to God, they remind God. So he doesn't forget about the situation. Not that he needs to, but he wants us to do this act of reminding for our good. In the Old Testament, sacrifices couldn't take away sin. All they could do is remind God to act. And the New Covenant, Lord's Supper, does the same. And there are a lot of similarities in the ritual as well. As we'll see, beginning today as we actually get into the sacrifices, all the sacrifices, the flesh is always divided in parts. The bird is pulled in half. The head is pulled off. It's from the body. The animals are always cut into pieces. Abraham, when he made the first sacrifices, the rather strange sacrifice that we find in Genesis 15, and the first time we have the specified list of five sacrificial animals, they were all divided in half. In circumcision, the human body is cut into two parts, a little part and a big part, but you're still cutting into two halves. That's the sacrificial action. And also, every time in the sacrifices, all the blood is taken out from the flesh, and in the ritual of the sacrifice, you do one thing with the flesh, and then later on, you do something with the blood, or vice versa. But they're not mixed. Now, you look at the ritual of the Lord's Supper, what Jesus said to do. He said, do this. Do what? Take the bread, break it in half, and distribute it. Then, after everyone has finished eating, distribute the wine. There is no possibility, if you follow the ritual as it is specified, there's no possibility of in tincture, that is dipping the bread and the wine, or sitting and having them together as if it was an ordinary meal. It's not an ordinary meal, it's a glorified meal. And there's no possibility of having groups of people come forward and get bread and wine and then sit down, and then another group from the congregation comes forward and gets bread and wine. The congregation has to act as a whole. And that's a reform principle, and it's a congregational principle, and I think it's a true one. You can't have tables. You need to have the congregation act as a whole. If you had a great big church, I would have several tables sitting around with elders guarding each one and serve people that way from those tables. But everybody eats the bread, and then it says, when he had supped, when they had supped, when they had finished eating. Sup means suppered. When they had finished eating, then you have the right with the cup, and you have a separate prayer. One prayer before the bread, and then another prayer after they've eaten the bread for the cup. Now, that's real clear in the text, isn't it? The churches don't do that for the most part. They have one prayer, and they may somehow or other mix having the bread and wine at the same time. And that's so traditional in the church. And yet, Jesus said, do this. And do this means do exactly what he laid out. When we look at Leviticus chapter 1, you could ask the question, it's all laid out there what's supposed to happen. You bring the animal in, you lay hands on it, you kill it, you skin it. The priest does certain things with it. It's cut into five sections. They're put on the altar in a certain order. The blood is done with. Now, how do you think Yahweh would have responded if the sacrifice had been done? The priest said, well, I'm in kind of a hurry. I think I'll condense this right. And we'll just slaughter the animal and get some of the blood out and then dump the whole thing on the altar and splash the blood on Well, we know that the God of the Old Testament would have been mad about that. But in so many of our churches, we've condensed the right of the Lord's Supper. And we're not doing what is said to be done. But when you do what's said to be done, then it's apparent the similarities of action between what's done with this bread and wine and what was done with flesh and blood in the Old Testament. The flesh is always torn in half, and the blood is always dealt with differently from the way the flesh is. In the law, in addition to that, the bread and wine that were there on the table of showbread, bread is taken out, eaten by the priest, the wine is always poured out. Different things are done with them. If you're an Israelite, you have a vineyard and you have a grain field. You are forbidden to plant grain in your vineyard. The two have to be kept separate. It doesn't mean you can't plant beans and mix your crops that way. Plant beans in among your wheat. It 
but when it comes to the vine and the grain, they may not be planted in the same place. They've got to be kept separate. Now, that just runs all the way through the Bible. In fact, all the way back to Genesis 1, where the two kinds of plants that are listed there are grain plants and fruit plants. Nothing said about tubers or broccoli or stuff in Genesis 1. The things that are mentioned are the grain plants and the fruit trees. So that runs all the way through it, and you see those parallels that are there. And and what I sought to do yesterday was to show how similar the New Testament memorial offering, we dare to call it the sacrifice and use that word, Eucharistic sacrifice of the Lord's Supper is to the Old Covenant ones. But now we need to ask how they differ, because there's an obvious difference. And that is, in the Old Covenant, the things that drew near were killed under the judgment of God except for the tribute offering. And the tribute offering was always put on top of a bloody offering, my knowledge. As a tribute offering, a cereal offering, was always set on top of a blood offering. And here you got the problem with Cain. Cain brought the tribute offering without bringing a blood offering first. In the New Covenant, however, we don't bring animals and kill them. Now, we can see a similarity in the ritual in that the Old Testament... The memorial sacrifice of grain and wine is put on top of the bloody sacrifice. And similarly, because Christ's sacrifice, bloody sacrifice, is finished once and for all, then on top of that, after that, we have the sacrifice of bread and wine. So again, the links in the chain are similar. But there is this difference. And what accounts for the difference? Let me focus the question by turning back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. And also, we'll take a look at Psalm 40, verse 6. Hebrews 10, 4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Well, now, if it's impossible for the sacrifice of bulls and goats to take away sins, then why were they required? Why didn't God just have them take bread and wine and break the bread and drink the wine and say, This is a memorial of the future coming of the Messiah. Or, if it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin anyway, why don't we continue to sacrifice bulls and goats as memorials? If they were never anything more than a dramatized prayer, in a sense, why this change? And I think that's the question we want to focus on, I want us to focus on. And I'm not sure I know all the ins and outs of the answer, but I will try to elucidate it as much as possible. And then maybe you have some observations too. Notice how Hebrews 10 goes on. He says, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sin thou hast taken no pleasure. Sacrifices for sin. It says in the book, Behold, I have come. Now, if we look back at Psalm 40, verse 6, it's a little bit clearer what of these things that are mentioned here are. Psalm 40, verse 6 says, Sacrifice and meal offering thou hast not desired, my ear thou hast pierced, burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Now, we can't take the time to go into the comparison between how we move from my ear thou hast pierced to a body thou hast prepared for me. The piercing of the ear is an adoption ritual in the Old Testament, and there seems to be some connection there. But the four sacrifices that are mentioned in Psalm 40, verse 6 are, the word sacrifice here refers to the peace offering. Peace offering and tribute thou hast not desired. And then he says, ascension offerings and peace offerings thou hast not required. So that's four out of the five. The only one that's not mentioned is the trespass offering, which is linked with the sin offering and could be seen as coming under it. Now it says... God says he didn't require these. They didn't seem to do anything. Back in Hebrews 10, verse 8, the author of Hebrews continues to summarize Psalm 40 by saying this, After saying above, peace offerings and tribute offerings and ascension offerings and sin offerings thou hast not desired, See, that's what's referred to in those four words. Sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and those for sin. It means peace offerings, tribute offerings, ascension offerings and sin offerings, purification offerings thou hast not required, nor hast thou taken pleasure in them. Now, there's a problem. What does the law say God's response is to these? Their sweet smell, a soothing aroma. 
The Lord smells a soothing aroma when Noah sacrifices. I had Noah sacrifices all the clean animals. Noah sacrifices deer and gazelles and all kinds of things. The limitation on the sacrificial list doesn't come until Abraham. But it says the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said, I'll never destroy the earth again. Now this verse says that God took no pleasure in him. Uh-huh. That word soothing, that does that have the uh, sense of placating or something else? I think it's the idea of placating and propitiating in some sense. <laughs> the Lord is angry and this soothes him, calms him. But he's not angry anymore. Now, but here it says, David says from Psalm, that God did not take pleasure in him. Is that a contradiction? The Bible contradicts itself. We've got a theology of P, which the priest came up with. It says the sacrifices soothe God, and now we have uh, David or writing in J or something saying, no, he didn't. That doesn't work. It's where liberals do this, you see. Well, no, I think that the answer has to be that it's those sacrifices did not really placate God. They only symbolically placated God. God says he chooses to be placated by them, but they didn't really do the trick. It's the same thing as saying the blood of bulls and goats cannot really take away sin. So what David is saying in the Psalms is that these are memorials of a future propitiation that's going to come. And the sacrifices really did not placate God. God didn't really take pleasure in them. He only chose to indicate in the symbolic pedagogical system well, then the question comes, why kill anything then? You see, as we focus the question down, why kill anything if it doesn't actually soothe God? Is it just a dramatized action? Well, in a sense, yes, it is. Now, the next part of my notes say groping for an answer. And that's what we'll do here for the rest of this lecture is grope for an answer. I think the answer is clear. You know the answer. With the death of Jesus Christ, there's no longer any animal sacrifices. But what I'm trying to do is try to focus on why that's so and the inner logic of that change. And let's begin by looking at Hebrews 10 again, verses 11 and then 17 and 18. Verse 11 says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Then verse 17 God says, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is a forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering of sin. Now, the contrast here is that somehow or other sins weren't really forgiven in the Old Testament. They were continually remembered by God. Something happened that was continually reminding God of sin so that they didn't really get forgiven now, it doesn't mean that individual people's sins weren't forgiven and they didn't go to heaven. But in a redemptive historical sense, historically, sin had not been dealt with and forgiven. And God was continually remembering sin. So it says in Hebrews 10, verse 3, In these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. God is reminded of sin by the sacrifices. But now God is not reminded of them anymore. He will remember them no more. There's been a change, an historical event. Sins have been forgiven and been dealt with once and for all. So that, I think, gets us into it a little bit. Now, what provoked God to require death in the Old Testament that is different now? I think a clue is seen in Romans chapter 7. If you would look there or listen carefully... Romans 7, 7 to 25. And listen to this passage, but as you listen, try to think in terms of the ceremonial law. Think in terms of uncleanness in the flesh and how the flesh provokes God to anger because that's where we're going to go. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin came to life and I died. Now, we're used to thinking about that morally, and I think that's what Paul is actually dealing with here, the real psychological and moral aspect of this. You tell somebody not to do something and that draws out of them 
the desire to do it. And the law brings the flesh to life. And then when that happens and that rebellion comes out of the heart, then God has to act in judgment. And the person dies. I died. But that's not a passive dying. I died means God killed me. Verse 10. This commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin taking opportunity through the commandment deceived me, and through it killed me. So sin somehow or other rises up when the law becomes manifested, and the result is I'm killed. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. When the law comes, sin awakens, and God passes judgment. Now notice how he deals with this in verses 14 to 25. He really runs through the same material three times, one with the normative perspective, one with the dispositional perspective, and then with the situational perspective, if you know what I'm talking about. And if you want to look at a chain, each one of these has the same chain. He starts off in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. The problem is indwelling sin. For that which I'm doing I don't understand, for what I'm, I'm not practicing what I'd like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. That's the contradictory life. But if I do the thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing it is good. That's comfort. So now, no longer I am the one doing it, but sin that indwells me. Now, what he does here, verse 14, I am of flesh, and to be of flesh means to be in bondage to sin. And what he does in these verses is isolate the flesh. And says, I am one thing, my flesh is something else, and the flesh is causing the trouble. This is the normative perspective. He says, I agree with the law. And the four steps in his argument are, there's the problem of indwelling sin. There's a contradiction that I don't want to be involved in sin. The comfort is that I actually agree with the law. And so the resolution is that it's not really me, but it is the flesh that is the problem, indwelling sin. Now he runs through the same argument a second time in verses 18 to 20. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. So now there is the problem, indwelling sin. Then the contradiction, verse 19. For the good that I wish I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. And then the comfort and the isolation of sin is in verse 20. If I'm doing the very thing I do not wish, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin dwells in me. Now, this is the dispositional perspective. The first one was, I agree with the law. The second one is, I, in my personal orientation, don't wish to do these things. Again, he's isolated indwelling sin or the flesh and said it's a part of me, and it's the part that calls up the wrath of God. And when it's manifested, God's wrath is called up. The law, when it draws near and encounters the flesh that becomes manifested, the result is death. Then he runs through this again, this time with a historical situational perspective. He gives the problem in verse 21. I find then the principle that when I wish to do good, evil is present in me. Then he says the contradiction. I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body. Here again, the reference is to the flesh waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. There's the contradiction. Now what's the resolution? The comfort. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? And then the isolation of sin. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, that's part of the comfort. That's still the comfort section. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. But what he's done again is he's isolated his sin in what he's calling the flesh, or the body of death, the death body. Now, again, we see this in terms, and rightly so, I think, in the contradiction in the life of the believer, that each of us, in terms of the normative perspective in verses 14 to 17, we agree with the law of God. In terms of the dispositional section, verses 18 to 20, we don't like sin, really. In terms of the situational perspective in 21 to 25, we see that historically sin's been dealt with by Jesus Christ and we're in a new situation. And you see I'm following the frame triad there and 
If you don't know what I'm talking about, then pick up John Frame's book on the three perspectives that's out there. But I wanted to share how that comes out here because I think it is in this text. And he cycles through each time isolating and dwelling sin. And he says that it's part of the members of my body. It's the flesh. It is the death body, the body of death. Who will set me free from it? I'm alive, but I'm in a body that is somehow dead. Flesh. Now, if you know something about Leviticus, this should begin to ring a bunch of bells because Leviticus 11 through 15 has got all these laws about the flesh. Inside your body, different from you, is this flesh that keeps erupting out, and when it does, judgment comes. You become unclean, and you can't draw near to God. And so what I suggest is that the Old Covenant represents this contradiction in symbolism, the symbolism of the laws of uncleanness, and that the background for Paul's statements here, in part, are the laws of uncleanness. If you want to see how this fills out, you want to fill out Romans 7, we go back to Leviticus, which we're going to do, of course, because (laughs) that's what this conference is about. But in summary, point two then, flesh, when manifested, calls forth the judgment of death, which is the declaration of uncleanness. Unclean means dead, as we'll see. This interaction came into play more fully when the law came. When the law drew near, then that interaction comes up. It applied more fully to those who were near at hand, the priests and then the Israelites, and then only at a distance, the Gentiles. The closer flesh comes to the law, the more pronounced is the manifestation of death under judgment. Now where I'm going to go with this, maybe you can see already, is that when the animal is brought near and my death is put upon him by my laying hands on him, then that judgment takes place. And that's true under the old covenant until Jesus comes. But let's now look briefly at the laws of uncleanness as they're set out in Leviticus 11 to 15 and remind ourselves of them or hear about them for the first time, (laughs) whatever it is. Yeah. I can see the argument there, you know, that the law came and so I died would be a reference to Mount Sinai and the giving of the law. And then all these contradictions describe life under the old covenant. I think the problem is that I think that that is a true application of the text, but it just seems to me every time I've gone back and looked at it that he's talking about the present state of a believer in Christ. And I guess having heard Rob Rayburn's thesis about the fact that Oftentimes, the phrase Old Covenant means a person who's lapsed back, and New Covenant is a person who's living in Christ. You could see that that dynamic would be present in the individual life as well as historically. But I can at least see the argument, the redemptive historical argument there. I just don't want to take Romans 7 and say, well, Paul gets out of it. That's not true of believers anymore, because it seems that it is. The laws of uncleanness, Romans 11 tells us that certain animals are unclean and they are unclean to be eaten. If you take their flesh inside your flesh, you become unclean. And what does that mean? It means that you're separated from God. Now, this was new, you see. Up until this time, people were not restricted in what they could eat. Genesis 9, verse 3, God said to Noah, Of every animal you may eat, I give it all to you as I gave the green plant. So Abraham could eat all the pork and shellfish he wanted. And Moses could eat all the pork and shellfish he wanted until he was 80 years old. These laws don't come into effect until Mount Sinai. Then animals that are unclean now no longer may be eaten. The difference between clean and unclean animals was known even before the flood because Noah took seven of clean animals on the ark and only two of unclean animals. But there was no specification of what you could eat and not eat in terms of that until Leviticus 11. The question is, why does this change come now? 
And I think the answer is because the giving of the law makes the law near to people, and now the flesh is more of a danger. Do you have a question? Because God says to Noah. Plus, remember, Moses didn't write this. This is dictated. This is divine dictation. All of these verses are in quotation marks. So it's God who comes and says this now. So but that always has to be taken into account. Yeah, yeah. Genesis 9-3 is the verse there. But you have a change in the sacrificial system, it seems, with Abraham, because Abraham is given five sacrifices and nothing else, and then those turn out to be the same five that are only allowed later on. But the laws of diet don't seem to change till now. And they're connected with clean and unclean and with everything else. Now, if you touch the carcass of a dead animal, one that you did not kill, you become unclean. You touch its dead flesh, and your flesh comes into play. And if that's true of dead animals, it's much more true of human beings, and Numbers 19 lays that out. We mentioned that yesterday. Well, if we go on to Leviticus chapter 12, we see that giving birth to children causes a mother to become unclean. For 80 days if it's a girl baby, and for 40 days if it's a boy baby. The difference is that the boy baby is circumcised. So that there is a sacrificial act, an act of cutting and shedding blood and dividing flesh into two parts, that takes place in order to remove her uncleanness in part. Since nothing like that takes place with a girl baby, the girl baby does not become a substitutionary atonement to cover the mother's uncleanness. She carries the uncleanness for the full 80 days. But the boy baby becomes a substitutionary sacrifice, in a sense, and his sacrifice of circumcision, the shedding of blood and cutting in half, takes away some of her impurity. Now notice verse 4. You see what the penalty is of becoming unclean. Then she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 33 days. That's after the first seven days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing nor enter the sanctuary until the days of her purification are completed. Now, there was no sanctuary six months ago. The sanctuary has just been built. And so these laws wouldn't have applied. There's no reason to think that Sarah, when she gave birth to Isaac, was set apart under these laws because there was no sanctuary space, no tabernacle space, no priesthood. But you see, what it means to be unclean is not that you can't touch anybody else or that you can't speak to anybody else or that anything else, that you can't go to parties, that you have to move away or live in a leper colony or anything like that. What it means is you can't go into the tabernacle area. As far as I know, it doesn't even mean you can't go to the synagogue. I haven't seen anything in the law that says you can't get together in the assembly of the people on the Sabbath day in the synagogues and listen to the Levi sermon. What you may not do is cross the boundary over into the special holy place of the tabernacle itself. Or if you're a priest's wife and you would have access to some of the holy food under ordinary circumstances, you couldn't have it right after having a baby. You may not touch any consecrated thing. Then chapter 13 is where the word flesh starts to come into real play. The word flesh occurs 17 times in Leviticus 13, and the laws of leprosy say that it is the flesh that's manifested. First of all, what is leprosy in the Bible? It is not what we think of as leprosy. Nobody knows what it is. In fact, there is no such thing as it. There are a series of conditions listed here that are probably different from one another in terms of their medical pathology. And you can have leprosy in garments, which runs through the warp and the woof, which means that if your tent gets leprosy in it, the tent has to be torn down. And you can get it in the walls of your house, Analogous, which is red and green mold stuff on the walls of your house. And obviously that's not, in terms of the biological aspect of it, it's not the same thing as leprosy in a garment or leprosy on your skin. And nobody knows for sure what this disease was. If it was a communicable disease, there's no indication it's communicable. And because microorganisms do evolve and change through history, it, it may well be that there's no such thing in the modern world that it's the same as these conditions. One thing's for sure, this is not Hansen's disease. It's not the rotting skin thing that we think of as leprosy. It's a series of conditions, and there are seven different ones listed here in Leviticus 13, but they all have certain characteristics in common that make them leprosy. And to be leprosy in the Bible sense, one of three things has to be true. First of all, 
in most cases, the flesh has to show through the skin. The skin is like the boundary around the flesh. It's like the curtains around the tabernacle. It's like the skin on the animal. For the animal to be sacrificed, you've got to take the skin off of it so its flesh is exposed 100%. If your skin starts to get real thin and your flesh starts to show through, you're in trouble because the flesh irritates God. And when God sees the flesh, then the judgment comes. And so thin skin and these other conditions are part of it. Verse 3, The priest shall look at the mark on the skin of the flesh, and if the hair in the infection has turned white and the infection appears to be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it's an infection of leprosy. Verse 9. Well, let's finish it. The priest has looked at him. He shall pronounce him unclean. You're not unclean until you're pronounced unclean. And you're not cleansed until you're pronounced cleansed in the case of leprosy. Verse 9. When the infection of leprosy is on a man, then he shall be brought to the priest. The priest shall then look if there is a white swelling in the skin. It's turned white, and there is quick, raw flesh in the swelling. The flesh is showing through, or even opened up, invisible, through the skin. Flesh is peeking out, and it makes God mad. Verse 20, uh, third case. The priest shall look, and behold, if it appears to be lower than the skin... The hair on its turned white, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is an infection of leprosy. It is broken out in a boil. Verse 25. Then the priest shall look at it. If the hair in the bright spot is turned white and it appears to be deeper than the skin, it is leprosy. It is broken out in the burn. The priest shall pronounce him unclean. And finally, verse 30. The priest shall look at the infection. These are all different kinds, you see. And if it appears to be deeper than the skin and there is thin yellowish hair in it, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a scale, a leprosy of the head or the beard. Now, you see what's happening is the flesh is speaking through. The sixth kind of condition that can lead to leprosy is if the condition is spreading. You don't see it lower than the skin, but it's spreading, which means that it is virulent coming out from inside. The flesh, the wickedness, is coming out and showing up and becoming visible And we know that it's not just some ordinary thing. It is a leprous thing because it's spreading. It has power. So in verse 7 says, If the scab spreads farther on the skin after he has shown himself to the priest for his cleansing, he shall appear again to the priest, and the priest shall look if the scab has spread on his skin. The priest shall pronounce him unclean. That indicates power of the flesh coming out on the skin, and that calls it forth. And the final case in verse 42 is if you get leprosy on your head. And this is really the climax. The idea of these judgments against the body culminates here in the last case, which is the leprosy on the head. And that's real strong, you see, in the Bible. The Nazarite dedicates his head of hair in the inspection for jealousy. The woman's head is let loose and her hair... There's a lot of stuff about the head. And, of course, it's the head-crushing idea that is involved with all of this. But if God strikes you on the head, you're in trouble with leprosy. Verse 42 says, If the bald head or the bald forehead, if on it there occurs a reddish-white infection, it is leprosy breaking out on his bald head or his bald forehead. It doesn't have to be spreading and it doesn't have to be lower than the skin. Of course, your skull is so close to your skin, it's really hard for it to be lower than the skin. But if it's on the head, if it's just there, if you're already bald and your hair is no longer covering you and sheltering you and making a barrier between you and God, then if you get these reddish-white infections on your scalp, then you become unclean. And what do you do, you see? Then you have to go around being dead. Verse 45, As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn, the hair of his head shall be uncovered, disheveled. He shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean. Now these are all the things you do in mourning. Tear your clothes, let your hair down, and cover up your face and cry unclean. Signs of death. Remember that when Haman the Agagite was removed from the presence of King Ahasuerus, it said they covered his face and took him out. Well, they were going to kill him. So this means a man is dead in the midst of life. He is cut off, alienated from the tabernacle. The barrier of the skin is failing and the flesh is exposed to God and this calls forth judgment. Then we look at Leviticus 15. We'll skip 14, which mostly has to do with cleansing the leper, and then talks about leprosy in houses, and we'll go on forever with these. This is only to get us back to the sacrifices. 
Leviticus 15 deals with issues of blood from the flesh. Issues of blood from any other part of your body doesn't make you unclean. If you have a nosebleed, you're not unclean. If you bite your tongue, you're not unclean. If somebody sticks a knife into you, you're not unclean. But if you have an issue from the flesh, you're unclean. And in this chapter, flesh means private parts when it occurs. And the word flesh is used seven times in Leviticus 15. And again, the idea is that what is inside of you, the defiled inner part of the man, is exposed, or woman. And when that flesh is exposed to God's view, then judgment comes. Now, to be unclean only meant one thing. It meant that there was no sanctuary access. In the case of the leper, during the wilderness camp, he had to move outside the boundaries of the camp. And in Israel, because the cities were slightly holier than the land, if you had leprosy, you had to move outside the city wall. You didn't have to leave the holy land altogether, but you couldn't be in a city. So there was certain degrees of alienation and separation. But the idea is you are alienated from God and you are expelled from the Garden of Eden. That's what death is. In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. What is death? Alienation from God. What is death? Being kicked out of the Garden of Eden. It's not true to say that God graciously postponed Adam and Eve's death. What that does is it reads the idea of physical death into the verse. But God said, in the day you eat of it, you will die. That's what happened. Because death is a much broader concept in the Bible than just stopping breathing. And so Adam and Eve do die on that day. And what it means is they are separated from God. They can't come back into the sanctuary. They're kicked out. Now, what's interesting about that is Leviticus 11 to 15 track Genesis 3. Genesis 3, God says, first of all, to the serpent on your belly you will go and you'll eat dust. Leviticus 11 deals with the unclean animals, and the ones that are unclean are the ones that don't have shoes, hooves, that crawl in the dust, in contact with the dust, and that eat dirt, that swarm and crawl in the dirt. Those are the unclean ones. You don't eat the serpent is what Leviticus 11 means, because the serpent is under the judgment, which is death. When you eat the serpent, you come under the judgment, which is death. The next thing God said was to the woman, he said, I will multiply your distress in childbirth. And here it is in Leviticus 12. What is distress in childbirth? Well, in Genesis, it means the woman dies giving birth to a child, like Rachel did. But in Leviticus, distress in childbirth means that she can't go to church for 40 days or 80 days. Because there's all this blood that's coming out of her flesh. And when it comes out of her flesh and her inner depravity is exposed to God, then it calls forth judgment. That's distress in childbirth. And then God says to the man, I will make you sweat when you work. And if we can't do this. You can read lots of literature in there that I've written on it. But leprosy is an enhanced form of sweat. The sweat, literally, Genesis 3 says, the sweat of the nose. It doesn't say sweat of the brow. It says sweat of the two nostrils. It's the same word as when it says God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And it says, in the sweat of your nostrils you will work. So the place where God gave life becomes a place of judgment. By implication, the nose is used for the face, but it's not the normal word for face or forehead is used there. It's sweat of the nose. That's where the judgment is put on the center of the face. The nose in the Bible is the center of the face. And that's where the judgment comes. Well, that spreads. And then leprosy is a form of sweat. And then the next thing we read is that Adam knew his wife Eve. And that is what comes under judgment in Leviticus 15. Issues from the private parts, defiling marriage and causing problems. So the judgments, the forms of death in Genesis 3 are symbolized in the laws of uncleanness, one after another. What does it mean to be unclean? It means to be ceremonially dead. And what does that mean? It means to come under the specific kinds of judgments God gave in Genesis 3. Crawl on your belly, eat dirt, have problems with having children sweat, have problems in your marriage. So, in summary, the flesh symbolizing sin when brought near to God provoked the judgment of uncleanness symbolizing death. Now we ask the question, why did these rules come into play at this point in history? Well, we've already mentioned the answer. And that is that the law came at Sinai. Before this time, the law had not been given. Now, Romans tells us, The death reigned even before the law was given, which means that in principle, the law of God was known. Death only comes in the face of the law. 
but there is a special sense in which the law came at Sinai. God gave the ten words to Moses, not to Abraham. And the Ten Commandments, which is the only thing in the Bible that was actually written by God's own finger, come at this point in history. So the law comes and draws near at this point. And the tabernacle is made as a shrine for the law. And if you have Vern Poitras' book, The Shadow of Christ and the Law of Moses, he does a wonderful job of showing that the tabernacle is an architectural form of the Word of God. Not just, as I mentioned last night briefly, that what we have in the Bible is a literary tabernacle. Everything has to be interpreted in terms of the words. We can't really make a tabernacle based only on the information the Bible gives us. It's a literary tabernacle. But also that what the tabernacle represented was the same thing as the law. So the tabernacle is a shrine for the law. The tabernacle represents the individual human being with the law in his heart. And it represents the community of Israel with the law at the center of it. But what that means is having God in your heart and having God at the center. And the tabernacle that is set up is a portable Mount Sinai, and you see this diagram in your notes. You look back at Exodus chapters 19 to 24, the geography of Mount Sinai is very carefully laid out there. You have an altar at the base, you have a boundary. If anybody crosses the boundary, they're to be put to death. Same is true in the tabernacle. Midway up the mountain, you have the place where the elders, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, go together to have a meal with God. At the top of the mountain is where the cloud is. And Moses is the only one who goes inside the cloud. And when he is inside the cloud, he cuts out the stones, the true graven images. The word is grave. He graves out the stones. And God writes on them. And the second commandment refers to that. God is given graven writing. And we're not to have any graven images. That's, the word grave is used only a few times in the Bible. And in Exodus, it's used for the idol's and is used for the stones of the Ten Commandments, which sets them in opposition. Moses is the only one who goes into the cloud, and that's where the law is. It's like the Ionic column. Is it Ionic? Yes, that has a scroll at the top. You have a column, and you have a scroll at the top, because the column represents the holy mountain, and the Corinthian column, you have a garden up at the top, all the leaves and fruit, and an Ionic column, you have a scroll at the top, because on the top of the mountain is where the gods give the word, and where the gods have their paradise. And that's what those columns represent in Greek culture, and the same thing's true in the Bible in its true form. Up at the top is where the law is. Now that is simply replicated in the tabernacle. See, the people don't have to go back to Mount Sinai in the Old Testament when they want to talk to God, because the tabernacle is Mount Sinai. The most holy place, only the high priest can go in there, and that's where the law is. The holy place, the priests can go in who represent the elders, and the meal is laid out on the table there. The altar is on the outside, and there's a boundary around it. All the same laws apply. So the tabernacle is built in Exodus 25 to 40. We come to Mount Sinai in the third month, and they start building the tabernacle in the sixth month, and they build it around to the twelfth month of the first year after the Exodus. And the first day of the second year, the tabernacle is finished, and God moves into it. And the week before that, the priests are consecrated. And so the priests serve, and God moves into the tabernacle. And they have an abide who are killed, and then immediately we have the laws of uncleanness. Because you see, as soon as God draws near and comes into the camp, into the tabernacle, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people become unclean. All these people whose flesh is becoming manifested suddenly become unclean. They weren't unclean the day before. Now they are. Why? Because God has come near. When the law comes, sin revives and I die. So the law is in the tabernacle. It's in the midst of the people near at all times. Point four, I just mentioned the tabernacle is set up in Exodus chapter 40, Leviticus 8 through 10. God fills the tabernacle and then five, immediately, as Paul says, sin revived and I die. The flesh is provoked to manifestation and God's judgments become manifest. Thus, the laws of uncleanness are given immediately. And this is where they come. Now, these laws only apply to circumcised Israelites. They didn't apply to everybody. They applied to those who were near God's peculiar people. And we see this in Deuteronomy 14, verse 21. You shall not eat anything that dies that you find is dead. No road kills. But you may give it to the alien who is in your town so that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a stranger. For you are a holy people of Yahweh your God. 
you may give it to the believing Gentile who lives in your town, or you may sell it to the unbelieving foreigner who's passing through the land. But you can't have it. Why? Because you're circumcised. You are a holy people to Yahweh your God. You're a nation of priests. The closer you are, the more strict the rules are under the Old Covenant. Now, all of this is symbolic ceremonial stuff, but the principles originated in the Garden of Eden. See, when sin came, God comes. God comes in the cool of the evening. He draws near, and what happens? Adam and Eve's sin is manifested. And so the judgment is death and expulsion from the garden. That's a moral form. Here is a symbolic form in Leviticus. We're back to the moral form of it in Romans chapter 7. Now, how does this connect with the sacrifices? Manifestation of the flesh and the need for blood sacrifice. If you draw near, then God is provoked and you die. See, at some point you get so close to God, the fire burns off your skin and your flesh is exposed and now you're in real trouble. Because the skin that shelters your flesh from the gaze of God is taken off. And you see, God also blinds himself to your sin in the Old Testament. He's in the most holy place and there's a wall of cherubim called the veil that's between you and him. Then there's another wall of a curtain that's outside the holy place and another curtain that's out in front of the altar at the doorway of the tabernacle. Three blue curtains in a row that are opaque. And so God blinds himself to your sin. And then you've got your skin that keeps it from you. But if you're dumb enough to come walking through all those doors and try to get in there close to God, then God's not going to be blind to your sin anymore. The closer you get, the more in trouble you are. So in King Uzziah, so he gets right up there next to the altar of incense where he has no place of being, what does God put on him? Death, leprosy on the forehead. The high priest has got a golden plate to shield his forehead, you see. All these shields and barriers to keep people from being too close to God. That's what all these... The high priest has all these layers of clothes on him before he goes in near. And he has a breastplate of righteousness on, you see, that shields him. All of these things shield him. Off all your shields, including your skin, you're in trouble. And if you draw near, God is provoked and you die. And they have a bike who are a case of someone who was instantly killed for drawing near in the wrong way. Abel's offering is another example. Abel comes near to God. Abel's going to die. So Abel kills an animal instead. And now we have the principle of killing animals right there. So that Abel doesn't die, so that Abel can draw somewhat close to God, he has to kill an animal. Because God requires death when the flesh comes near to him. Now Cain didn't, and God was displeased, and ultimately Cain was forced farther out. Cain was kicked not only out of the Garden of Eden, but out of the land of Eden. So he's forced farther out because of his sin. Abel maintains his position in the land of Eden, by offering a blood sacrifice. It doesn't get him into the garden, but it keeps him in the land. He can be that near by offering the sacrifice. Now, you bring the substitute. Now, what is put on the substitute? That's the question. When you lay hands on the animal, what goes on? Now, I know we're going to have to talk about this in terms of the details of sacrifices, but I'm persuaded that you do not put your sins on the animal. Those animals can't be sinners. But what you put on the animal is your liability to death. Those animals can die. Now, plants can't die because they don't have the breath of life. But animals can die. So it is death that's put on the animal. And I discussed this some in the paper on the whole burnt sacrifice, and I know we'll discuss it more. But I think this is the difference between the animals and Jesus. We'll get to it in a minute. Death is put on the substitute, and that's why the animal dies. Death is put on him, and so he dies. And we see at least that much is the case. And I don't think sin is transferred to him, at least not in the same sense that it's transferred to Jesus. By drawing near, however, you remind God of sin, and your flesh cries out to be killed. And so, as Hebrews says, in the sacrifices there is a reminder of sin, because you remind God of sin when you draw near. And that's a problem. So you bring the sacrifice, and the sacrifice takes the death that you deserve, but the sin is not taken away. 
your flesh is still there and can still erupt again. And the next time you come, you've got to bring another sacrifice. No matter how many times this happens, sin is not removed in the sense in which it's removed in Jesus. So that's why I think the animals are killed in the Old Testament and not in the New. Jesus comes. He's our substitute. He bore our sins as well as our death. Unlike an animal, Jesus can be a sinner for us. He who knew no sin was made sin. Well, that may mean a main a sin offering, but He bore our sins. Not just our death, but actually our sins, our flesh. When He drew near to God, our sins on Him, our flesh cried out for death. And so He's slain. But see, what's different is this sacrifice takes away sins and removes the flesh. And now, if you draw near to God, you don't have a flesh that cries out for death. If you are in Christ, it's a different historical situation for the believer. This sacrifice is accepted fully. And so Hebrews tells us that we can be a korban now. We don't have to use an animal as our representative. We can draw near. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Since, therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He inaugurated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, that's a Melchizedekal high priest, great priest, let us draw near, you see, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water, no ashes of a heifer, mixed in with the water that washes us. We no longer provoke God by bringing ourselves to Him because we have new flesh. The flesh of Christ is given to us. And so that provocation is not there when we draw near to God. I think to carry on the thought from last night, the provocation comes if we draw near to God and then do the Lord's Supper, which calls on God to act, and then we have you know, done so in an empty manner then there's a problem. But simply drawing near, we don't have that flesh that cries out for judgment. We have, as believers, new flesh. And so, the memorial sacrifice is no longer done in the context of the provocation of the flesh. It's no longer done in this context of death. The final death has happened. The Old Testament animals didn't propitiate God, but they had to be killed because God had to kill something every time we drew near. Now, that's happened once and for all. The links in the chain are still the same in form. In the Old Covenant, we bring an animal before God with us. In the New Covenant, we bring Christ before God with us. We remind God in the action of the Lord's Supper. We kill the animal in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we display the finished death of Christ, breaking the bread and separating the bread and wine. We proclaim in our ritual the death of Christ before the Father to remind Him. The animal as our representative is then sanctified and glorified. In union with Christ, our representative, we are sanctified and glorified. Now that concludes my remarks on this, and that is at this point in my thinking the best I can do to explain why animals in the Old Testament were put up. In the New Testament, we don't have that. As I say, the quick answer, the answer that's true, and we all know it's true, is that the death of Jesus Christ ends that. The why and how it ends it is the question I've tried to raise. The blood of bulls and goats did not satisfy God's wrath against sin. And so, why were they done? Well, I think it's all a dramatic action to show the nature of sin and also to show the difference in history. In the Old Testament, death spreads to all men. The Old Covenant, death spreads to all men as one uncleanness contacts another and spreads and spreads and spreads. If you're unclean, you touch somebody else, they become unclean. Death is spread. In the New Testament, that's change. And it's change because of the work of Christ. Well, we could take discussion for a few minutes on this if you have any. I don't know that I can go further. But <laughs> yes. Well, how would we define flesh? Well, sinful nature is a good definition. I somewhat prefer the idea of a death nature that we have death inside of us that comes out or challenges God and provokes the judgment of God because death works sin. And in Romans 1, the punishment for sin is more sin, being given over to it. 
And since the punishment for sin is death, there's this an awful lot of comparison there. But I think we do have to recognize that the actual stuff that's under our skin is not in any sense what's meant by flesh. It has to mean somehow or other the Adamic nature. And, you know, I'm not really enough up on it to answer your question real clearly. But go on. Is it, is it uh, nature as it manifests itself? Well, I think we could accept that. Sinful nature as it manifests itself through the body in that everything we do, including our thoughts, uses this first creation body that is in union with Adam still in a physical sense. We haven't gotten a resurrection body. This is the physical body, including the brain, is the structure by which we act. But, but there's a kind of a mystery there. Anybody have a comment on that question to help us? It's literally the sweat of the nose and not the sweat of the brow. I'm not sure. Except that the Hebrew has a word panim, which means face. And it's usually the word for face. and kind of refers to your cheeks and the flatness of your face. But the word off is the word for nose. And the nose is regarded as the center of the face in the same way the heart is the center of the body. And so in Hebrew, when it says that God is angry, it literally says... That God is nosed. When it says God is long suffering, it says He is long of nose. And when it says that when Elkanah gave Hannah a double portion, it says that He gave her a portion of two noses. And if you bow with your face to the ground, it's literally often bowing with your nose to the ground. So the nose is the center of the expression of the face. Of course, it's the highest point on the face. You know, the bride has a nose like a tower. And the idea somehow is her, her face is glorious and prominent by using that expression, not that she has a big, long nose. See, I mean, She may have because Semites had no problem with that. But I think it's the nose is the center of the face that's the idea there. God breathes life in there, and the judgment is given there. So if the nose is a, what is it, part for the whole? Synecdoche, is that it? Whatever the figure is, using the part for the whole or the central part. Then the sweat of the whole face and the sweat of the brow comes up there. But exactly how to get to the 666 on the forehead and the golden plate on the forehead. And the golden plate, you see, has seven letters on it. Holy to Yahweh is Kadosh Yahweh, Q-D-S-H-Y-H-V-H, seven letters. The seven letters on the plate and the number 666 is the opposite of it, is the foil for that. And they're both on the forehead and leprosy is on the forehead. In some sense, sweat of the brow is probably not totally inaccurate, but it's not a literal translation. And given the fact that in Genesis 2, the breathing in is to the nostrils, then I think we need to take the Genesis 3 is playing off of that, sweat of the nostrils. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I guess I was almost assuming that, but you're right. I mean, the statement is to Adam... You will surely die, and that continues to be in force until we are repositioned in the new Adam. Of course, you know, the, the problem here is that our systematic theology, and we know this is true, we know that David was really also saved by being positioned in the second Adam, and yet he was under a system of sacrifices that required the death of animals to be brought in. And so what accounts for it? It has to be an actual historical change and not a believer change. Yeah. You, that, that's a good thought that the only person who would become completely white. There's more to the laws of leprosy than, than I discussed. It seems to me that the emphasis on the whiteness of the skin relates to the whiteness of glory. So that when Jesus is glorified, he's all white and his hair is white. And it, it talks about white hair and uh, white skin in the place of the leprosy. And I see that as kind of a counterfeit glory. A glory that is at the same time corrupted by the flesh. Man seeks glory as Adam and Eve did, but finds it in corruption instead of receiving it from God. And yet, if the entire body becomes white, then there's no longer any flesh that is seen with it to corrupt it. So there's a kind of a complete glory there. But I've never been totally satisfied with any explanation that I've read or thought of for why the leper who becomes completely white is regarded as clean. <laughs> It's in Leviticus 13. Usually that's kind of allegorized to mean that the leper who's completely white is the one 
who sees himself completely as a sinner somehow, and so his sin is removed. But I don't think that'll work within this universe of discourse. In verse 13, 13, 13, you know, that's easy to remember. The priest shall look, behold, if the leprosy has covered all his flesh, covered all his flesh. You see, that's what you're getting at. He shall pronounce clean him who has the infection. It is all turned white. He is clean, but whenever raw flesh appears on him, he shall be unclean. So again, the flesh is covered over by the leprous condition. So now he's clean. But as soon as it starts to withdraw and the flesh is exposed again, the leprosy would be a new skin, a new shell. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, and that's a tough question. I think animals are seen as having a limited kind of culpability there. But actually, the judgment in that case is as much against the owner as it is the animal because the stoning destroys the hide and the owner loses everything he has in it. The fact is, a lot of times, people's animals reflect their own personalities. And I think that <laughs> that's a dangerous thing to say. <laughs> Those of you who have pit bulls who just got you tight and categorized. <laughs> I think there's a certain amount of truth to that that animals take up and mirror the characteristics of their masters. And I think there are a lot of dynamics there. At the same time, we can't adopt the modern view that animals are just organic machines who live by something called instinct that is completely undefinable and nobody even knows what it is. Instinct means animals do certain things, and now it's just just an empty word that's dumped on animal behavior. We use brains and they use instinct, whatever that is. Uh, That's more complex than that. But at the same time, I don't think animals are not capable of actually engaging in a rebellion against God. The bull that rises up and attacks his master is acting out in a parable what we did with God, and I think that's a lot of it too. Do you have a comment on that, Peter? Uh, Anything about that? Oh, yes. That's right. Well, I would have to expand on my comment to say that over the course of centuries, people have bred animals to a certain thing, too. But see, even there, they're taking on human characteristics in the aggregate. (laughs) We don't bark as much as our dog does, so it didn't learn to bark from us.